Prepare to experience the strongest radio allowable by law. Secrets will be revealed. Myths, Myths dispelled. Dispel. From the studio gym where excuses never apply, it's Superhuman Radio with your host, Carl Lenore. Welcome back to another episode of Super Human Radio. We have a really good show today, and it's good on a lot of different levels, and I'll tell you why. Because there's a lot of us who lead what we consider clean lives, uh, but many of us do certain things that maybe really aren't in line with the desired outcomes that we want in our lives. One of those things is alcohol, and another one of those things is tobacco use, uh, whether you're chewing tobacco or smoking tobacco. Uh, these are the two most abused substances, substances in our population. They both have addictive qualities. They both rewire the brain to desire more. The big difference between addiction and, uh, and, and, and uh, what's the other word I'm looking for? Um, but anyway, addiction has specific uh, signatures when you look at brain and how it, it changes. And we're going to talk about that from a, 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 an aspect of epigenetics. What is it doing for us? There's a lot of people that read studies and it says, oh, you know, a glass of wine a day is good for you. I personally don't believe that. If it's good for you, give it to your babies and give it to your dogs, right? Why, why hold them uh, out and not let them benefit from the good things from alcohol? But we're going to talk about what it really does to the body uh, in, in, and whether or not it is uh, something that you should be partaking in in just a minute with uh, Dr. William Seeds and Dr. Uh, Daniel Elias Martin Herans. And before we do that, we have to, of course, pay homage to our title sponsor, and that is Legendary Foods, makers of amazing snacks uh, that you can eat and feel like you're cheating, but you're not. Of course, their uh, seasoned nuts and nut butters are out of this world. And the big craze right now is their tasty pastry which is basically a Pop-Tart with nine grams of protein and less than one gram of sugar. And don't just buy them for yourself. Buy them for your kids. When they start going back to school, send these in their lunchbox. Their, their friends will be jealous, and no one will know they're eating something actually healthy. Uh, go to eatlegendary.com, and uh, you can learn more about that. And, of course, uh, tell them Carl sent you by using the code SHR10 to save 10% off your entire order. And now, without further delay, let me just click a couple buttons here. And uh, oh, this is this is what it's about when you produce your own show as you're hosting your own show. And uh, we have are joined by both Dr. William Seeds, which many of you uh, already know, and uh, Dr. Daniel Elias Martin Herans, all the way from the UK. How you guys doing? Very well, oh. thank you, Carl. Yeah, we're we'll great. Here again. I got worried there. I was going to, oh, no, we lost the microphone. Um, so I, I think we can all agree that there is a large push, not by the tobacco industry so much, but definitely by the alcohol industry to somehow uh, normalize alcohol use by saying it's actually good for you. It, when we look at epigenetic testing, uh, do we see evidence, Daniel, that uh, that alcohol is good for you? So low levels of alcohol um, have been, as you said, for a long time, you know, promoted as, as something that is healthy uh, for the general population. And according to the latest studies, um, and more specifically a study, for example, that was done in 2018 in The Lancet, which is one of the most uh, prestigious uh, medicine magazines or, or journals uh, where they look at, you know, data from 195 countries, uh, females, males. Uh, what they show is that there is no amount of alcohol that is good for your body, yeah. right? So yeah. I think, you know, obviously, um, you know, science and, and epidemiology keeps changing. And, you know, as we have more data, we discover new things. But I would say, you know, from a scientific point of view, what we do know until today is that no level of uh, alcohol is, is good for our bodies. And then, you know, that, that just validates something I've been saying on the show for over a decade. I like getting a buzz from alcohol. I like the way it makes me feel when I'm out with friends. It lubricates everything. It makes everything easier and fun. And 
I, I sound so much more intelligent to myself when I'm drunk. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, the reality is that I've never believed it was good for me. And I just say that's an, that's an accepted risk that I'm will, a, a risk I'm willing to accept. But the reality is I've always said that I don't think alcohol is good. But tobacco is another story. I think it's pretty obvious that tobacco is bad. And I think in, uh, when we think about tobacco products, we do think that they're bad. Yet people start smoking today. Right now, there's people who are going to start uh, using tobacco products, smoking and so on. Dr. Seeds, it, what, what happens when someone is exposed to tobacco products uh, on an epigenetic level? So the 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 process is really the same as what we do and when we're looking at uh, at any disease it's it's a change of uh, methyl a methylation change that happens um, on the cytosine it's a it's a methylation that happens and uh, it changes the signature of that gene uh, and it's we've shown that even low exposure uh, to uh, smoking versus high exposure still shows epigenetic changes of methylation uh, sites and they've they've identified up to I'm pretty sure it's been up to over a thousand sites I think that's right Danny close to a thousand sites that they have recognized where there are true methylation changes um, and in particular uh, the uh, alkyl uh, hydrocarbon uh, um, gene repressor is one specific that's followed all the way through that is affected with uh, smoking and it's it's a they've even shown that smoking affects that methylation changes in a smoke in a pregnant woman smoking have uh, genetic or epigenetic changes in a child so that that's a those are significant I, I think significant factors of of showing that there are real changes that happen in what that gene is able to do after it's affected by that by that change even more so with the epigenetic changing uh or, or uh, studies we've been able to show you know that you can reverse depending on time frame you can reverse some of these changes where you can get them back to what a non-smokers uh epigenetic profile would look like and but, so, but something but something there has to be an intervention to do that it's not it, it, of course I noticed that some of the studies I looked at indicate that just cessation uh, will in the host will will change things. But what about the transgenerational effects that we have? A, we have a, a, a bullet item up right now that talks about that. There's a, this transgenerational effect going upstream to uh, future uh, children and grandchildren. If you stop smoking before you get pregnant or before you father a child, because we know it's in the germline of the, the father as well. Daniel, can we save our future generations or are they stuck with it because of our stupid decision? Yeah, so obviously uh, this is this is quite a difficult topic. And, you know, there are some things that we do know already and many things that are unknown uh, still in, you know, in humans, in us. Um, one of the things that we do know is that if the mother smokes while she is pregnant uh, from from the future baby uh, and that is considered an intergenerational effect so not transgenerational but intergenerational um, then we can detect uh, some of that signature as dr. Seed said uh, in that you know baby and then and then adult even you know decades after after that happened so that is truly if you think about it you know it's scary um in the sense that we know that it is possible that somehow those people their the, the health of those people are being affected decades afterwards because their mothers smoked in the you know while while they were pregnant so obviously we don't truly understand yet what are the the big consequences for the health of those people we do know that those signatures exist um and i think you know in the next few years we will start to understand uh, what are the consequences of this much better you know, it's um, funny. My, my mother, my mother smoked when she was pregnant with me, and she also took one of the earliest benzodiazepines, Librium, when she was pregnant with me. And my sister used to joke with me when we were older because I always had allergies. I had respiratory problems when I was a kid, 
And my sister used to laugh and say, mommy smoked when she was pregnant with you. Like, like it was like she was putting the, the hex on me. But, it, you know, I'm listening to this and I actually feel sad. I feel like, oh, my God. So the, the scales were already tilted the day I entered the world because my mother smoked while she was pregnant with me. And no doctor ever told her not to. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we do need to make, uh, you know, I think now everyone is much more conscious that, you know, you should never smoke to start with. Uh, but if you do a smoke and you're going to be a mother or a father, you should quit uh, months, if not years, before you're thinking about having a baby. And, you know, I think that's that's a recommendation that everyone should follow. It's one of the best investments that you can do for your health and that of your children. Uh, and I think there's there's no doubt that as we understand better the mechanisms of how this happens, uh, you know, it be become it will become more and more clear how you know mutations and also epigenetic changes uh, cause these things. But um, yeah, I think everyone should to try to avoid that as much as they can. I'm gonna yeah. start a GoFundMe page for me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, Go ahead, I, Doc. I think Danny made a really good point that people should should really pay attention to, and that is the female that is interested in getting pregnant and not having these factor, these methylation factors affecting the, the baby's uh, genomic profile. We know that if you're a heavy smoker and you've been smoking over, you know, five to seven years, it can take over two years, two years to get a profile that can be normal for smoking. So that means, like Danny said, it can be years that you have to be prepared to understand what you're going to do in in potentially changing your offspring. And, and I think that, you know, those kind of messages need to be made really clear so people understand there are very there are very significant consequences uh, with with trying to um, when you're it's not just you stop smoking in in six months you know, things are all better and, and heavy smokers, it's a big deal. And it, it, that's a long time to get that normal pattern back, that normal uh, methylation pattern. And, and so, and every, every time we talk about methylate uh, epigenetics, we talk about methylation. So it seems to me that everyone's in agreement that while senescent cells are the uh, watermark of bad aging, it seems like the real magic in aging better is establishing the appropriate levels of methylation and demethylation. Am I, am, is that correct? So yeah, it's, it's part of the it's part of the story, definitely. And we are unraveling this as we as we speak. So you know, this is a really really hot topic in in biological research and aging research at the moment. Uh, trying to really understand what are the main you know, molecular mechanisms behind the aging process and what we can do to, to reverse that or at least, you know, slow it down. And as you mentioned, we know that we accumulate senescent cells as we age in different tissues. And these senescent cells are like some sort of zombie cells that secrete a lot of inflammatory molecules uh, and that, you know, reduces the, the way or like it, it makes the tissues not work so efficiently anymore. Um, and another of the things that we've seen is that there are this epigenetic changes, uh, and more specifically, a type of epigenetic mark, as you mentioned, known as DNA methylation, uh, that also happens during aging and, and also across tissues, right? Um, so now the question is, uh, are these uh, methylation changes causing aging, or are they a consequence of all the things that are happening during aging? Uh, and I think probably the answer is going to be that it's the combination of both. Um, so I do think that there will be you know, part of the of the biggest story uh, of what is really driving aging will will be at the epigenetic level, but I I do think also that many of the markers that we use might be a more downstream consequence of of the core aging process. Uh, and as most of the answers in biology, the you know the answer is normally complex. Yeah, and that's and that makes us all sad because people are very very monolithic. We want to know. Just tell me the one thing. I need to do, and it's never one thing, and that's actually an insult uh, into the, the uh, reality of the complexity of the human being. I mean, it's just, it's, you know, it, it, we have to start looking at ourselves the way we look at computer systems as opposed to a laptop. You know, uh, th there are so many systems is, uh, oh, thank you, thank you, Scott. I was actually picking up my laptop, my, my phone, because Tommy said he had no audio, 
uh, and he is having a good audio. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was distracted. Sorry about that. So, you know, it, it, we are so much more complex. And, and sadly, even the pharmaceutical agenda tries to, to distill things down to this one pill, that one thing. And, you know, I'm sorry to tell you, if that is all your bandwidth can handle, you're, you're lost because this is about addressing systems. It's not one thing. Like I have some problems I'm dealing with, and I realize now it's not one thing. It's not just going to be my diet that has to change. There's a lot of things that are going to have to change. And so it's a really good point. So tell me, there's a new word out there now that I see in some studies, polyepigenetic DNA methylation scores. What, what, what is polyepigenetic? Yeah, so obviously uh, the word comes from polygenic risk scores. So when we look at not epigenetic, but genetic information, uh, what we realized over the years is that looking only at one position in the DNA to try to explain a phenotype or your risk of disease, et cetera, is many times not enough uh, because most of these phenotypes or most of these risks are quite complex. So you need to use thousands and thousands uh, of, of different positions in your DNA to build biomarkers that are really accurate. Um, so a polyepigenetic risk score would be the same, but looking at epigenetic data. So instead of using only, you know, one or two positions of one position of the of the DNA where we're looking at the methylation pattern, we look at thousands of them or millions of them, and we try to build a biomarker uh, that is much more accurate using uh, the information from all those markers. And that's that's really what we do at Chronomics. And I, I was going to say, Dr. Seeds, one of the things that you were always excited about, the chronomics test, and I felt like this was a good opportunity to, to run the uh, special, too, uh, because my audience is the only audience in the world that can get 70% off the single best epigenetic test in the world, and it's a saliva test, which means you don't have to go to a doctor, no one has to draw blood, you just spit in the tube. I just did it the other day and sent mine in. I can't wait to see it because I really feel it's going to give me a direction on how to approach getting feeling better again. But Dr. Seeds, one of the things that you said to me that you were so excited was that, that this particular test tests 20 million data points in your DNA as opposed to the nearest uh, a closest match of uh, uh, epigenetic test is only like what, uh, 2,000 or 80,000 or something like that? Um, uh, maybe up to 400,000, maybe okay, okay. 600,000. This is 20, this is 20 million. So when you talk about polyepigenetics, which I see this word being used more and more in epigenetic research, it's like, oh God, you know, we've been looking at this one target when we have all of those targets out there that are, that are hurting us. No, yeah. That's right. A, yeah. The more markers, a, the better. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, any st any statistician will tell you that it's all statistics. The, the 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 higher number of variables you have to evaluate, the more accurate and, and the more predictability um, you can have in your testing. And that's that's really the most I think the a very important point to bring up here. It's it's predictability and how can you translate this information. And, and that's where we're going with all of this information is being able to um, predict uh, and translate where does this progress into disease? You know, where do you stratify into any disease process? Uh, just like we're talking about right now about smoking. You know, what is the with our what are the markers to push you into cancer, esophageal cancer, or lung cancer, or bladder cancer, or what are the markers that are going to push you more towards the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? And, and that, mm. that information is tremendous. In fact, we have information from looking at epigenetic changes that there's probably 45% of the population that gets COPD has nothing to do with smoking. What, oh, there he is. What yeah. that? No, no, you're, you're back. You're fine. Yeah, that's a great point. Some of these things may have nothing to do with your smoking at all. And, and that's, that's crucial information to, to start building. And, and this is where I think the, you know, all the work that uh, Danny and his team are doing are just, uh, it's just remarkable to see how this is going to advance and change the way we, we look at medicine. Because this, these are the things we need to help our patients make better choices and to convince them that, 
you can make better choices and that they potentially can be reversible. And that's what's, that's what's so, I think that's this, the point no one should, should devalue about the epigenome that it is reversible. And that's why this is, this is why we're so focused on it. This is such a great discussion because that's one of the things that people need to understand. The beauty of the epigenetic model is you cause the problem, you can fix the problem, but you first have to get your compass pointing in the right direction. And the only way to find that out is the compass has to have seen the bad direction. And that's what establishes the, the, the role of the epigenetic test. When you see where you went wrong, you can then go right. But if you're just shooting in the dark and trying this and trying that, oh, I'll try the carnivore diet for a while. Oh, I don't know what's working. The carnivore diet may work for you, but there may be other things that you need to add into it to see the results you want. I, I love this. I'm so excited because I really believe that getting a picture of my current epigenetic status, my digital twin, is going to allow me to get on the right path. And that could be a myriad of things. I could find out that I've been training way too hard for too long. And that's part of the reason I feel the way I do. And I'm willing to acknowledge that and, and move on that. Uh, Dr. Seeds, I have to just mention John Peaks just commented he has a, a physical for work coming up and nothing quells the white coat syndrome like the chill pill. He, he just reminded him he needs to order some. So I thought that was kind of cute. Um, there, there is, um, there's really, is really a great opportunity here, a hopefulness. I kind of think that this is like optimistic medicine where other medicine is pessimistic. You go in, they say, oh, you got cancer. Oh, but here we go. Oh, you have to change paths. And it's, it's really exciting to me. Yeah, so no, I, more, I, I fully yeah. agree with that, with that, Carl. I think, you know, in, in the DNA testing space, I think the previous, you know, only looking at genetics sometimes can be a bit of a pessimistic medicine in that sense. Um, so sometimes, you know, if in the case, for example, of of genetic variants that allow you to choose, to choose treatments, etc., there you can, you know, you do have a choice and and it's very useful. But in other cases, uh, it will just tell you that you have this risk uh, and that there is, you know, little that you can do to change that because you were born that way. And I think, you know, some people might want to know, but in general, I think everyone wants to take information that you can do something about, right? And and that and that is the positive side of things. And that's where you know epigenetics is, is so powerful in that sense. In first of all, being able to measure all these changes over time, uh, compare against yourself, against your baseline, and, and build, as you said, your digital twin, and then take a specific interventions and have a way to see if they are working or not uh you know over over time and i think that completely changes the way that that we think about preventative healthcare the way that we do medicine and the way that we avoid all these complex diseases and and then this this here bullet i just put up speaks to something that dr seed said it, that, that there's longitudinal data that shows that the methylation changes accumulate with increased use of tobacco and you can't, you, they, while they can attenuate, you can, by quitting, you can attenuate them. The longer you smoke, the longer you'll have to quit before they go back to normal because there's this, this accumulation. You know, we forget about accumulation. I, I'm a big fan of acknowledging that part of the reason things happen as we age is because of the accumulation of things that aren't good for us. That could be iron. Uh, it could be toxins. It could be uh, the, the components of, of tobacco use that are, are, but they accumulate over time. It's like junk. You can't just stop and expect all that junk to just disappear. You got to wait for it to come out of your body. That's right. Yeah. And I think, you know, all these studies are super interesting, uh, in the sense that they have shown us the complexity of, of these dynamics. Right. And before we didn't really have a way to quantify this in the long term, uh, because the main problem with previous biomarkers to, uh, you know, that look at, for example, uh, tobacco exposure, they normally look at things like cotinine in the body, which is a metabolite that you can quantify, but the problem is that the half-life of that is max a couple of weeks, right? So after one month, approximately, you don't have a way to know how that person is recovering, for example, from quitting smoking. And that is where epigenetics becomes super powerful, right? So if you're a former smoker, you decided to quit. You want to see how you're improving, not only during the first month, but over the next months, over the next years, 
and you know during the rest of your lifetime really and and see how you're improving because that's a very positive message if you have a way to really see your improvement uh you know there are tons of studies that show that from a behavioral or psychological point of view that's so powerful for people to to stick to those interventions and you know this this type of epigenetic biomarkers really give you the possibility for the first time to yes. quantify these things in the long term rather than just uh during the during the first month Dr. Seeds, it's like people who train with weights and they're not sure that the program they're on is going to give them the results they want. So they hop from program to program without ever seeing any results. And had they stuck with one program, they would have seen it. But the problem is the evidence isn't always fast enough for us to say, oh, I'm accomplishing my goal. And it's even more uh, evident when you're looking for health. You, you, how do you quantify your health? So maybe you get a bad night's sleep. You think, oh, it's, I'm getting worse. I got to stop doing what I did yesterday. This gives you an opportunity to truly quantify, oh, I just got to stay with the program because things are working. Yeah, and, and I think that's a, it's a really important point to bring up when I'm sitting down with a patient and I go over lab values with patients, you might as well just stop there because you, they have no idea or they're having a difficult time in following how you evaluate those lab values and, and, and how that correlates to them. Whereas you have a graph, you have a picture, you've got a picture in time and you can relate it and stratify it to other people around the world. That's pretty powerful. And, and yes. that's what people take home that snapshot and go, Holy smokes. Okay. This, this is, this is something that is valid and, um, and I'm being compared to this tremendous bank of data uh, and I can see it and I can see where I need to go. This is fantastic. And, and that's, that's, that's such a valuable tool in, in trying to change. You know, you can't, I can't, it, it really doesn't matter what I say. Um, it matters how I say it and how I get the message across to a patient where they're the ones who determine, you know, how committed they want to be to change. And the more valuable I can make that message, the better I'm doing my job. And that's where this is so, this is a, this has changed the way you have a conversation with patients. Never had anything this powerful before in, in having discussions of where your patient gets it instantly. It's not, it's not a, it's not one of those things that takes a while to, to look at something and, and then to digest it, they get it right away. So do you think there's something magical to, uh, to the heat factor and tobacco, or do we see some of these same problems with methylation with people vaping, uh, uh instead of, you know, they're, they're still putting certain, certain chemicals in their lungs that are getting distributed to the body. Is this a, is this a problem with nicotine? Is it a problem with the toxic, uh, particulate matter that's going down in their lungs. What do you think, Daniel? Yeah, no, that's an incredibly interesting question, and I think one of the one of the areas where you know a lot of research is going on now, uh, not only from the epigenetic side of things, but you know in general. Uh, obviously, there are more and more people that are starting to vape instead of smoking, uh, and you know I think it's early days to really know what are the long term consequences of vaping, right? Uh, but there are a few studies that are starting to look at this, for example, from the epigenetic side of things. Um, in one of them, they look at a specific type of, uh, you know, part of, the, of our DNA, which is known as line one, and these are repeats. So regions of the DNA that are the same, and, and they occupy a great proportion of, of our entire genome. Uh, and they actually come from, from ancient viruses that inserted long time ago, and then, you know, mm -hmm. they stay there. So they've been associated with, with many things, you know, that have to do with our predisposition to develop cancer, um and things like that because they can be unstable sometimes and what keeps them under control is actually dna methylation so you know in general more dna methylation in those regions keep them you know without without causing too much trouble and mm -hmm. uh what these people in this study saw uh looking at both vapors and, and smokers uh what they saw is that there was hypomethylation so a loose of methylation in this line one element uh, which could be a proxy for increasing your chances of developing cancer for both. Um, so having said this, this was a relatively small study uh, and, you know, it's early days. 
but I wouldn't be surprised if it turns out that you know some of the damaging effects that we see in our epigenome and in our genome uh, caused by smoking are also observed in vaping. Uh, but I'm also sure that there will be different ways by which they, they can affect us. And I, and I think, is, is that, Danny, where, so when that hypomethylation in that region occurs, it changes the promoter region where the methylation as, a, aspects occur. And so that changes from that methylation, even though there's hypomethylation, the promoter region changes its methylation. Is that correct? So line ones uh, can be all over the all over the genome. So they are, you know, a specific type of sequence that can be in many places. Uh, I'm not 100 percent sure to be <laughs> honest with you, like whether they are uh, they will be found in promoters, or I, I'm assuming there might be some cases where that's the case. Yeah. Um, but I think in this case, the main problem is that if we don't keep them under control, uh, they themselves can then cause genomic instability. Sure. Um, sure. So it's a different. Yeah, it's a different mechanism by which they can become uh, dangerous in, in our genomes. Right. We're going to take a quick commercial break. We have a lot of questions and comments piling up here. We're going to get to all of them when we come back from this break. We're going to take a quick commercial break. When we come back, we're going to talk about alcohol consumption because this is something that all of us seem to think, well, you know, it's okay. I read a study. It's okay. It's good for me. Uh, but it really isn't. And we're going to discuss the effects on the epigenome uh, from alcohol and get to your questions as well. So stay tuned. We'll be right back with more Superhuman Radio. Imagine if you had a digital twin, one that you could compare your own health and fitness outcomes to, one that showed you whether or not the things you're doing, food you're eating, or drinks you're drinking are actually working for you or against you. Well, now you can. The first ever advanced epigenetic saliva test that compares 20 million different data points of your DNA to help predict what is aging you faster or keeping you younger is being introduced to my audience at a 70% discount from the normal price. Go to Seeds dot md slash epigenetic dash test today to learn how to get your own digital twin that will help you take the steps to live longer and stay stronger don't wait because this is a limited time offer not available anywhere else once these tests are gone they're gone again go to s-e-e-d-s dot md slash epigenetic dash test today to learn more how often do you sit with your laptop right on your lap how much time do you spend on your cell phone? Are you in a technology-packed office Monday through Friday? Are you worried about this type of radiation? Now there's something you can do about it. GetLambs.com. This radiation has been linked to infertility in men, glandular tumors, gut microbiome dysbiosis, and impaired sleep quality. Now you can provide 360-degree protection to at-risk parts of your body with radiation-proof apparel from GetLambs.com comfortable, breathable, and 99% effective. Go to getlambs.com and use coupon code SHR for 20% off your order of $100 or more. That's getlambs.com, G-E-T-L-A-M-B-S.com and code SHR. I love beef. And if you love beef, listen up. I've discovered the best tasting beef in the world, and that's not an exaggeration, at piedmontese.com. The Piedmontese breed is famous from Italy for being lean and unbelievably tender with half the fat and calories of traditional beef. Even typically tough cuts are tender when it comes from the Piedmontese cows. And for the first time ever, Piedmontese cows are being raised here in the USA. Get two free 10 ounce New York strips when you purchase $50 or more at Piedmontese.com with code SHR. Go to P-I-E-D-M-O-N-T-E-S-E dot com and use code SHR today. You will never eat any other type of beef ever again. Whether your goal is to build muscle or burn fat, you'll find everything you need at Redcon 1. Need help getting a good night's sleep? Try Fade Out or the most popular pre-workout supplement on the market today, Total War. Sign up for their new transformation challenge and win $10,000 or shop for apparel that people at the gym will know that you are serious about your training. Need a testosterone booster that works? Check out Boomstick. Whatever you need, you'll find the best quality supplements on the market at Redcon 1. 
go to redcon1.com. That's R-E-D-C-O-N, the number one, dot com, or go to superhumanradio.net and click the Redcon 1 banner ad today. New Mass Pro Synthogen X2 just upped its own legendary game. To distance itself even further from the rest of the pack, Synthogen X2 now has double the key active ingredients. If you've ever wondered what steroid-like recovery feels like, Synthogen X2 delivers. See why others compare it favorably to powerful bodybuilding drugs at Synthogen.com. Mass Pro Synthogen. When you train with it, you'll gain with it. You're listening to the Superhuman Channel. We're ripped and we're ready. Welcome back to Superhuman Radio. We got a lot of comments and questions I want to put up before we move on to alcohol. Um, so Rigo Vargas, uh, who has actually been on my show in the past, has a really good question. He says, I'm hesitant to get genetic testing because I'm afraid to have my genetic information on a database somewhere. Am I paranoid? change my mind yeah thanks thanks Rico for the question I think I think you're not paranoid I think you're asking the right question um, obviously genetic information and epigenetic information is very sensitive data and you should be you know very careful where where that data is being stored and who's taking care of it um, I think I kind of speak from chronomics you know very proudly in the sense that we have embraced uh, a type of legislation uh, which is the European law for this which is known as GDPR uh, so we are a European company, and what that means is that, uh, you know, we have the highest standards of, of data privacy and security in the world. And, you know, as a company, we've always believed that, uh, you know, people own their data. We're just like, you know, storing it carefully and using it to give you the best that we can with it. Uh, and in that sense, you know, our users are always in control of it. Uh, so first of all, in terms of security, uh, you know, the highest standards for this in terms of encryption, uh, both in uh, at rest and in transit, et cetera, et cetera, are taken into account. Uh, and then in terms of privacy, the data is only used for those things that, that our users want it to be used. Uh, and they have complete control uh, on this all the time. So at any time, if you contact us and say, hey, I want you guys to give me my data and delete everything that you have on me, uh, you can do it at any time. Uh, and, you know, we love, you know, this philosophy where, uh, where the users really empower uh, to, to be in con complete control of, of the data uh, that is being stored in a secure way. So uh, I would say in that sense, Rigo, uh, you, you can trust us. <laughs> but uh, obviously, you know, I understand that it's a very sensitive type of data and uh, that you should, you should do what you feel is better for you. And I, I think that, needs that to be yeah, Dr. Seas, because you spoke about this before. You actually spoke about it in terms of what we have here in the United States, right? Yeah, exactly. I think that needs to be emphasized how their rules are stricter. And that that's very important that the this data is very much your data and you control it. And this these are the strictest rules in the world. Uh, on this type of data and this is what they're following and I think that really resonates to patients and, and people when they understand that those are questions you need to ask that should be one of the first questions you ask is where where is this data going what control do I have over it and are you utilizing this data outside of your institution with other you know are you collaborating and selling my data and uh, those are those are really really big points to bring up, and and I think that's what makes this um, for me so valuable to know because I'm always looking out for the best interests of my patients, and that's why we're talking about this. Well, one of the things that I think has come to the forefront now, aside from just what the company does with the data, is what happens when the company is sold. Twenty three andMe was sold to a pharmaceutical company, if I'm correct, and a lot of people feel like, oh, great, now this pharmaceutical company has all of my information about my health and 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 what and even though that pharmaceutical company may not do anything sinister with it in fact they may learn from it and think hey you know we've ignored this uh these symptoms and we the, the bottom line is people feel like oh my god you have my genetic fingerprint now what happens when you sell your company do they what if they don't abide by the standards and rules that you've established when you are running your company that's right so uh, the way that it works with GDPR, with the you know, with the legal basis under which we operate, and that, as I said, we embrace, is that 
you know, because the user is in complete control of the consent that is given to that company. If that oh. consent were to be changed at any point, they will need to, you know, opt in for that. So what that means is that, um, you know, in the case of 23andMe, what happens is that GSK, which is a large pharma company, license access to that database uh, to, to develop drugs, right? And because the 23andMe users have consent uh, for research purposes, uh, that, that data can be used obviously in an anonymized manner uh, with, uh, you know, any research related purpose, then that was possible. Now, what happens with us is that the consent that we collect from our users is that that data at the moment can only be used uh, to provide with our services and products and keep improving uh, the stuff that we that we give to you, right? So what that means is that if we wanted to do anything else, we would need to go explicitly and ask you. And that also mm. applies uh, in, in this type of cases. So uh, what that means is that your, your data is being protected under the you know most minimum contract that you can have in terms of sharing it. So it cannot be shared with third parties. And then if we, for example, want to establish a new research project with a university because we want to use your anonymized data to, to understand something better, uh, most of the people will say yes, but it's all about you know you being in control and you deciding why your data is being used for. Uh, and yeah, I so think, you can opt out. I like that. So you'd exactly, have, you, yeah. you would have to go back and say, hey, we're selling our company and we're selling our data. Do you want the new company to have your data? And you would either opt in or opt out. So that's that, at least- That's right, yeah. That's a that you, allows you to control the destiny of your data, and also exactly. correct me if I'm wrong, but data is not saved with the person's personal information. The data is just raw data with a, a number attached to it, and then in another database, that number is attached to the person. So people can look at the data in in a very anonymous format without knowing. Oh, Carl Lenore has this gene. That is correct, yeah. So we completely isolate your molecular data, your epigenetic data or your genetic data from the rest of your personal information. So in our systems, they are in two complete separate places. So it's impossible to be able to match both of them uh, unless you have you know, uh, the, the, the ultimate key, if you wish. Um, so what that means is that uh, you know, for all these purposes that have to do with research, et cetera, et cetera, uh, if you were to consent, opt in, uh, to share your data in an anonymized way, all the other party will see, let's say a researcher in the University of Cambridge would be raw data, uh, but they do, they wouldn't have your name, they wouldn't have you know your postcode, they wouldn't have anything like that. So they wouldn't be able directly to go and say, oh, this is the data from uh, this person. So that's yeah. the way that you know all the studies uh, that involve uh, human data are performed nowadays. And I think you know I think most of us, if we feel secure. And we feel that our data in an anonymized way is being used correctly. I think most of us will volunteer for that Absolutely. data to be used for research. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and, and I was just thinking of that. And then what about when you die? Once you die, does the data, is, is it then available to whoever? Or do, does your right to protect your data transfer to your family? That's a good question. I actually don't fully know the answer to that, um, if I'm completely honest with you. Um, I think it would probably vary between countries um, as well, uh, because obviously everything that has to do with inheritance, et cetera, et cetera, and who has yeah. you know the right to decide on on different aspects after someone dies changes between countries. So I'm pretty sure legislation at that level will apply. Uh, but yeah, definitely, it's it's a very interesting question that because, I think because it's becoming opinion, more and more important. My opinion, the data becomes more valuable once you die and we know what you died from because now we also have an endpoint to match up yeah. your epigenetic journey and go, oh, look at that. That's what he died from. So that is valuable information. Scott Lawler says uh, he's talking about the training program. I'm not about finding the best program. It's about finding a good program that works for you. I agree with you a thousand percent. And Victor John Andrew Mifsid, uh, who's been on my show and Doc knows, uh, said that he's waiting for his chronomics test to come back because he's excited to see the results, mm -hmm. uh, specifically uh, as it looks at his genes and his, uh, he has a condition, um, IRD, I think it's, uh, yeah, retinitis uh, pigmentosa. And he wants to see uh, if there's anything that he can do, obviously, uh, to respond to that. Um, okay, so we're going to move on now to alcohol because most people who drink smoke and most people who smoke drink. And they do them both at the same time, uh, which is really funny. 
But uh, the reality is we, when we start looking at the whole methylation uh, phenomenon, alcohol looks like it's even worse for you than tobacco. Am I right about that, Doc? Doc, see yeah. Yes. So, so actually there's a, I, I mean, I think they're both bad. <laughs> I, and I think there's you. We can we can relate that to different aspects of what, of of how alcohol and and smoking can affect you. Um, I think one of the interesting things is that we're just learning more about the metabolites of alcohol that actually do have direct effects on um, uh, specifically acetone, um, where an ac acetyl groups um, affect the histones of DNA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's these post-translational changes that, that actually have a profound effect in the brain, changing the epigenetic signature in the brain. And, and that's, uh, that kind of information I think is, is monumental now in, in moving forward of really validating that this is a, this is a serious toxin you're putting in your body when you can validate and show right away very quickly that you're, change you're changing the epigenome of neurons in your brain and and the fact that they're they're showing i i think it's the ac i can't remember if it's acss2 or something uh um danny that it's that that gene that enzyme that is important in in changing and and how you develop those behavioral changes of wanting to drink more or or so forth so so we're finding out so much more about that um that when when I saw that those papers that were starting to come out about the brain, I was like, okay, you know, besides everything else we know, this is this is seriously significant and in being able to validate it epigenetically. That's right. Yeah. And I think it's super, you know, it's it's very interesting the fact that alcohol, which is one of the most consumed things in the world, uh, is one of the least really understood drugs at the mechanistic level. Uh, so you know, it's very, it's very interesting with all these new studies, as you mentioned, Dr. Seeds, for example, that have created very strong mechanistic links, biological links uh, with directly the metabolites that are produced um, after you drink alcohol together with, uh, you know, how your genes might be regulated even in the brain. Um, so, you know, these direct connections really tell us that probably the story behind alcohol and how it affects our behaviors and, and our health is quite a complex one. And also, uh, something that we should definitely need to, under, you know, we need to understand more uh, because it's so widespread. Um, having said that, we do know that, you know, we can use epigenetic information, as I'm sure we'll discuss in a second, to quantify how, you know, the way that you're drinking alcohol is, is affecting your health and how that is changing over time. Do you think there are people out there who um, seem to metabolize and deal with alcohol better than others are there some people that can get away with it and some that can't you think danny yeah no that's absolutely the case i mean we we do see that already uh in our in our data set um so you know people can drink exactly the same amount of alcohol and yet have different consequences and the reason for that is because uh there are many factors that are going to affect the, the response of your body to to alcohol right there will be things that have to do with your core biology so your genetic background, your uh, sex, your age, uh, you know, your overall lifestyle. Uh, and there will be things that have to do with your behavior towards alcohol drinking, right? So there are people that uh, will drink the same dose, but in different ways. So some people might spread it across different days and never engage in binge drinking, while all the people might just drink everything one Saturday night. Uh, and obviously, you know, the consequences of that are also uh, very different. And that's why it's so important to start to develop these biomarkers and have these biomarkers that at the end quantify the, the end point, right? Like what the way that it affected your biology at the end of the day, because all these variables, you know, if we only look at self-reported data, it's very difficult to really tell right. what happened, right? Because we don't have someone monitoring in real time, okay, I'm drinking this amount today, this amount tomorrow. When you ask someone, how much do you drink? They will tell you, I don't know, five, five pints of beer a week or, you know, but it's very difficult. And there are tons of studies that show tons of biases in the way that people self-perceive 
Well, I, 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 we know we know that people underreport what they perceive as bad behavior and overreport what they perceive as good behavior. So if somebody That's says right. to me, "I just drink a couple days a week," I know they're drinking five or six days a week. If they say, "I just have one drink," I know they're having five or six. I mean, because they know it's something that they shouldn't be doing. And they don't want to say, oh, I'm doing this and I don't care what you think. They, they care what other people think. So they underreport. They always do, especially when it comes to alcohol. Yeah. And I think that's why it's so important because, and I can, I can speak from, you know, in this case, in my case. Uh, so the first time that I took the test, um, I was drinking not so much about the, the national recommended guidelines, which in the UK is around 14 units of alcohol per week, which I think is equivalent to something like maximum five pints. Uh, or, you know, five beers per week or something like that. Uh, but the problem is that I was doing it mostly at the weekend, right? And then if you do that during one or two days, then most of the time that's unhealthy, right? So when I actually yes. look at my exposure at the epigenetic level, it wasn't incredibly high, but it was getting close to the red, right? So I was really shocked when I saw this because I, you know, I never really thought or I never felt that that was really affecting me. And since then, I actually decided to uh, not so much reduce the amount, but try to spread it across different days, right? Uh, and and also try to reduce it a bit. Uh, and I, in one year, I managed to you know dramatically see the the change. So I was you know really happy to to see in my in my own body how you know I was able to to get back to the the place where I should be. And I think the important thing here is that. Uh, you know, what we're doing is a preclinical measurement. So we are detecting stuff that happens years before you will develop proper liver damage, for example. So the current biomarkers that we use to, to look at this, things like amino transferases in blood, et cetera, mm -hmm. when you have that high, you already have liver damage. And by then, yes, you might be able to recover, but it's already too late. You already got proper damage, right? Well, the stuff that we are measuring happens before that. So we are able to, to see your trend and where you're heading uh, before you get that damage. And, that, and that's why this, these biomarkers are uh, so important. And that, that's a really big point that, that he made, Carl. And, and Danny, thank you for bringing that up because that is, that's the most valuable tool you can bring to your patient is when you're, you're getting your preemptive and you're giving them data before they would even see anything that we traditionally have had. And I think you bring up a great point that I really like is the typical, I shouldn't say typical, but doc, I only spend the weekends where, you know, I work hard all week, I work out all week, and then on the weekends, this is what I do. And I still say, okay, that doesn't work. And you just you just gave a great example of, um, and, and I'm, I'm gonna give you a lot of credit for doing that as a young man to be able to come to that conclusion, because it's, it's very difficult to convince, um, and, and Carl will appreciate this with our with our the, the the people who really do train hard. They do great things with their bodies, and then, in my opinion, they go out and destroy it in one or two days. And then they want to go back, and they think that they're controlling it, and they're not. I could yeah. completely live without alcohol. I've done it for long period. I mean, I when when I got married and had children, I probably didn't drink for you know, 18 years. I mean, I had the occasional glass of wine here and there, but, and, and once I found physical culture, it was more important for me to make gains in the gym than it was for me to have a drink on a Friday night. In fact, that caused a lot of friction between me and my ex-wife that I wouldn't drink wine anymore on the weekend. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's really, it's really sad because so many people are willing to justify alcohol use and turn to um, studies that are basically uh, designed to help them, you know, bias bias studies that help them mitigate the guilt of doing something bad. You know, in in the simplest terms, alcohol is a neurotoxin. Mercury is a neurotoxin. I'm sure that if you took small enough amounts of mercury, you'd feel high. It'll probably affect your head where you feel like woozy and stuff like that. But nobody's going to start out going out taking little bits of mercury because they go, oh, no, that's mercury poisoning. Well, it's alcohol poisoning. That's what makes you high. Alcohol poisoning makes you high. That's what it is. I mean, it's just yeah, really sad. I think, I think the important point to be made here is that, you know, no amount of alcohol is good. And, you know, the latest studies that we have, that's what they say. Um, you know, if some data changes, then 
you know, I will be very happy to <laughs> update my knowledge on that. And uh, but to this day, uh, I think that's clear. And you know, the reason why other studies in the past have found that maybe low doses are good is because there are you know there are tons of confounding factors that can affect that. Um, you know, there are surviving biases, so all sorts of like epidemiological biases in many of these studies. Um, and you know, it's very it's very very difficult to to you know at those very low doses really have the power to to detect these changes, right? Um, and you know, there is also the aspect of uh, some types of drinks having components on them that might be healthy, such as, for example, resveratrol in red wine, while the alcohol itself is the bad thing. So what you want to do is to have the resveratrol without the alcohol. Without the alcohol, um, right? Yeah. So you know, that's that's the sort of stuff that uh, you know. I think you know, this this studies that you know they might be true that have found, for example, associations between red wine and uh, you know, good health outcomes, they won't, you know, it's almost impossible that they will be because of the alcohol. They will likely be because of the rest of the compounds that are in red wine that are doing the, the good thing, right? Um, so at the end of the day, I think the key take home message is no amount of alcohol is good. Having said that, I'm also Spanish. <laughs> I know, I'm uh, Italian. I love, that, I love Sambuca. Exactly. I love Sambuca. I, I love, I love red wine. And I think, you know, like anything in life, we also need to be happy. So uh, from a more, I guess, philosophical point of view, I, I think everything in moderation is, is fine. I, and uh, Doc will tell you, I love Sambuca. It makes me cry. When I have a couple glasses of Sambuca, <laughs> I get very emotional. I love everybody. Everything is great. Uh, you know, and I, I, I like red wine. It's okay. But I, I rather have a, a Negroni any day. <laughs> I like Campari. <laughs> I like a little Campari and some gin and everything is, everything is smooth. We're going to take our last commercial break. We'll answer some more of these questions. And we'll wrap up the show. Uh, again, I'm going to run this one more time for people to see. If you want to see things that your doctor will never be able to see, if you want to help your doctor be a better doctor, if you go to seeds.md epigenetic dash test, uh, I'm sorry, seeds.md slash epigenetic hyphen test slash, you'll be offered a thousand dollar epigenetic test for the low price of around $200, I think it is. It's 70% off. And I know people from this show who've bought them, not just for themselves, but their wife and their children, because they're going to give their children a wonderful gift. And this is something that your doctor can't do for you. He checks your blood pressure. He does these rudimentary blood tests. He puts you on a, a statin drug or something. Th this, is, this is archaic medicine. This is the new medicine. Actually knowing what's hurting you and what's helping you. You can now find that out with a good test like this that tests 20 million different points of your DNA. The more data, the more data points, the more information. We're going to take a quick commercial break and we'll be right back with more. So stay around. We'll finish up with some more alcohol stuff, I think, here. Are you a fan of the low-carb lifestyle? Having trouble getting fat adapted on your keto diet? Feel like your digestion has stalled? Now there's Capex. Capex increases fat loss and energy on any low-carb, no-carb diet, all while improving digestion. Capex boosts AMPK and muscles by 52% and fat cells by 300%. Capex increases ATP in your liver by 22%, a key part of energy production, all while revving up the fat-burning hormone adiponectin by a whopping 248%. Nothing works like Capex. And now you can get Capex for up to 42% off by going to kenergize.com slash SHR and choosing one of the purchase options and using the code SHR. That's K-E-N-E-R-G-I-Z-E dot com slash SHR and code SHR. Hey, this is Carl. For 14 years, you've heard me talk about can eye drops and they being the reason that I do not need reading glasses at now 61 years old. But I regularly get emails and messages from people who've been using 
can see and having some amazing results. Recently, I got an email from a fellow named Chad, who because he was on dexamethasone eye drops for over six months, developed a cataract. Can see eye drops actually reduced my cataract to the point where even my doctor has a hard time finding it. I will never stop using can see eye drops twice a day. I've been using them since 2008, he says. And you should be too. There is no better way to keep your eyes healthy and seeing clearly than can see eye drops. Go to wisechoicemedicine.com today and get on board and we will both be looking into the future with very clear vision. Do you remember those delicious toaster pastries you had when you were a kid? You know, the rectangular sugar-filled snacks? Well, guess what? Legendary Foods has just made low-carb toaster pastry. This is the first of its kind and honestly, these things are amazing. They have three to four net carb, less than one gram of sugar and nine grams of protein. You can eat them right out of the wrapper or lightly toast them. The only question is which flavor, strawberry or brown sugar cinnamon? They're available at eatlegendary.com and Amazon. Quest Nutrition makes bars, cookies, chips, and pizzas out of complete dairy-based proteins. Our products minimize net carbs and sugar without sacrificing taste. Each delicious chocolate-flavored chip, cookie chunk, and crunchy crumble is custom-made to maintain Quest macros. It's time to enjoy foods that work for you, not against you. It's time to enjoy your Quest. Imagine if you had a digital twin, one that you could compare your own health and fitness outcomes to, one that showed you whether or not the things you're doing, food you're eating, or drinks you're drinking are actually working for you or against you. Well, now you can. The first ever advanced epigenetic saliva test that compares 20 million different data points of your DNA to help predict what is aging you faster or keeping you younger is being introduced to my audience at a 70% discount from the normal price. Go to seeds.md slash epigenetic dash test today to learn how to get your own digital twin that will help you take the steps to live longer and stay stronger. Don't wait because this is a limited time offer not available anywhere else. Once these tests are gone, they're gone. Again, go to seeds.md slash epigenetic dash test today to learn more. You're listening to the Superhuman Channel. Don't hate us because we feel good. Welcome back. We're talking about epigenetic testing. We're talking about things that affect epigenetics. We're talking about two things that a lot of people in the United States and abroad do. I, actually, I think smoking is down in the United States compared to places like Europe and Asia. Uh, but, you know, t tobacco use, alcohol use, they're, you know, they're, they're things that everybody feels comfortable doing, but they are very, very damaging. And, you know, in, in light of this whole coronavirus thing, it's disingenuous for people to say, Oh, we're saving lives by shutting down the country. Um, 100,000 people a month die from tobacco use. I don't have the statistics on alcohol. But think about that for a second. 100,000 people a month die from cigarette smoking and tobacco use. That could even be chewing tobacco and dip and all these other disgusting ways to get your caffeine, or your nicotine. That was a Freudian slip because caffeine's a problem too. But when you think about it, we're worried about, you know, oh, we've got 38,000 deaths in the United States. That's a third of what dies every single month from tobacco use. How can we say we're doing the right thing? We're worried about people. We want to help people when the reality is 100,000 people a month die from tobacco use. And we don't care. And you know why? The government gets their money. It's called, it's called taxes. They make taxes on, on tobacco use. So if we really care about people, we have to address what a tobacco is doing to the population. And I, I know I'm not asking you guys to comment on that because you're scientists and, and you know, I'm just, I'm just trying to put things in perspective here a little bit. Um, so let's, let's wrap this discussion up a little bit. So in summary, these two bad actors, alcohol and tobacco, work the same way. They disrupt the methylation landscape and they affect our health. Is that pretty much the, the bottom line? Yeah, I mean, they will do it in a slightly different ways. Each one of them, you know, will have their own uh, specifics about the way that they affect our health. Uh, but obviously both of them will have, you know, exposure to both of them are negative to our health. Uh, They're both risk factors for a lot of diseases. Uh, and, you know, using this epigenetic information, this epigenetic test, 
we can quantify over time how this is affecting us personally, uh, taking into account our genetics, our age, our lifestyle, uh, and you know, be able to follow this over time, as you said, with with if you wish a digital twin, uh, uh, you know, a person of yourself, but uh, with a lot of data to compare against, uh, and you know, take specific actions to to go and improve. Uh, and the first point that you require to be able to properly improve and, and really know that it's working is to, to have a way to measure it very accurately. And that's that's really what we can give you. We give you the most accurate way to quantify in the medium and long term the effects of these different risk factors, alcohol, uh, tobacco, but, but also the things. So, Dr. Seeds, is there anything kind of a 30,000 foot view that we can all agree upon that can help reestablish the methylation landscape in the body? Well, I think it's just a, I think the 30,000 foot view is it's an amazing tool to be able to, you know, we're, we're used to being reactive and, and dealing with it as, as physicians, it's always, we get people when they're at a state where things have already changed and they're hard to correct we now have a method that we can actually look at something before it actually may happen and cause serious damage where we can make real changes that will affect their life for the positive um, significantly. So I, I think it's really important to understand that, that we haven't had this capability before. And, and this is, this gives the, this gives the patient more ownership and more authority in taking care of themselves and seeking that knowledge that they're desperately looking for to improve their health and make sure what they're doing is improving their health and having changes uh, specific to where maybe we couldn't follow those with blood levels or certain lab tests. We couldn't tell you much other than, yeah, they're looking good. Well, here we can tell you Look at this. Look at where you started, and look at where you are now. I, I think that I, I guess I guess really what I was asking, and I'm going to rephrase it because a good friend of mine, Ron Penna, the founder of Quest Nutrition, loves to tell people and me that quite often it's not what you start taking, but what you stop taking, or what not what you start eating, but what you stop eating. That there seems to be a lot of emerging evidence, and I get emails from people all the time. What should I take for this? What should I take for that? And I start to ask them questions. Well, what do you do now? Because quite often the magic isn't in adding something in, it's removing something that is the insult. So in, in your estimation, both of you, I'll give you both a chance to answer this, the things that actually help uh, reestablish the methylation pathways, are they things you start taking, like B vitamins, or are they the things that you stop doing that stop disrupting it? Yeah, Dan, that's, that's quite a yeah yeah that's quite a complex <laughs> question so i think in some cases you obviously need to have the basics uh so you need to have the basic vitamins like some of the nutrients for example we know that affect directly methylation levels so you need to get those covered right but then after that uh i agree that a lot of the stuff that is going to affect negatively our epigenetics has to do with the stuff that we shouldn't be doing uh so stuff like you know obviously the smoking being exposed drinking. to air pollution, drinking, uh, all this sort of stuff. You know, there are actions very simple that we can take to improve our health without the need to add anything else. And in that sense, you know, I think once you have covered the basics, uh, I think most of the audience right now is about, okay, I agree with, with that view of, we need to remove a lot of stuff that is, that is bad. Um, so yeah, I would say both ways, but definitely looking more from removing the stuff. What do you think, Dr. Seeds? I, I think you're right on. I, and I think that just goes back to what, uh, I think that's a great question, Carl, because that's how you can really establish your relationships with your patients and saying, okay, look, I, I get it. I, I, and I keep going back to this example, but it's an example everybody can agree with and follow. Okay, I get it. You think you're healthy. You think you're working out every day, but on the weekend, this is what you do. Let's just change that and see how it changes this. Mm -hmm. Let's just, just just follow with me and do that. That's a powerful way of getting that type of focus to change because what are we doing? We're removing a habit. And, you know, I'm sorry, but alcohol and tobacco, they're toxins and they're nothing more than toxins. And 
that's this we now can absolutely start being i think very honest yeah yeah absolutely honest about it yeah they're bad for you let's just get these last few questions up here and uh and then we'll we'll, we'll let you go so rigo vargas says uh do either of you have an opinion about of some alcohol alternatives like butan butandiol. I didn't know that you can get high from butandiol. Isn't that a that's a ketone, isn't it? But butandiol is like a floor stripper. So it's something you use to strip floors, but they use it to uh, uh, it's it's a gamma butyrol acetone that they use to take to get. Is it like GHB? Yeah, it, uh, yeah. It's it's get well. It's uh, it's GBA. It's GBA or I think it's GBL or something. But what happens with that actually is it's a significant toxin because it it becomes yeah, it, it gives it gives people brain problems like brain it, damage. It's metabolized to uh, to uh, to a gamma hydrogen uh, butyrate, and that is toxic. It causes arrhythmias. It causes. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's sig it's significant uh, uh, liver failure. Um, it's a it's a toxin for sure. So that's a really good question because I didn't think that was legal actually. But um, no, it's not. It used to be a date rape drug. What they used to use it for date rape because it it, it renders you uh, completely you know unconscious and and immobile. People used to use that as a date rape drug. They used to put it in girls' drinks. That's why that's why GHB was taken off the, off the market because guys were putting it in people's drinks and knocking them out. Well, that's the metabolite of that. Yeah, GBL, that's, right. Yeah, GBL yeah. turned into the GHB, right. Yeah. Uh, Scott Lawler said he'd ordered the test, but he's just about to pull the trigger on some BPC uh, oral. He said he will get the test eventually. Uh, thank you, Jeff Clifton. I think he was talking about when I was saying about tobacco and people really don't give a damn about health if they continue to support the uh, sale of tobacco. Uh, could uh, Dr. Seeds update us on a timeline for his peptide protocol book, volume one? He was discussing it the other day with somebody. When's that book coming out, Doc? That book is out to the publisher right now. Oh, so it should be hitting shelves pretty soon then. It should have been out. It, I, th I think it should have been out here last month, but because of this COVID issue, it's been, I don't know. It's, I, that's the black hole. Once it goes there, it's the black hole. I've, it's a new black hole I've identified, and I can't. Uh, I have I have no control of, but it's it's exciting because it could be tomorrow, it could be next week. I I it's there. Uh, we're gonna take uh, a commercial break, and when we come back, we're gonna be joined by a guy who I love his products, and they make a lot of sense. Um, there's a lot of discussion about five G around right now. You can actually do things to protect yourself if you understand why you need to be protected. Of course, before we go, uh, I want to go ahead and just uh, promote one more time that you can get this amazing epigenetic test that's only available to my audience at seeds.md slash epigenetic hyphen test slash 70% off, 20 million data points of your DNA are tested. And it's a saliva test which means you don't have to go to the doctor. You don't have to prick your finger. You don't have to have blood drawn. You just spill the vial. I, I, I just filled it up. You just fill the vial up with saliva, close the cap on it, screw it tight, put it in the package that they give you, send it back. And it take, how long does it take, Danny, for people to start to get the, the results back from their, their testing? Yeah, so normally it's around eight weeks. Um, obviously, the current situation with like, you know, sending samples, et cetera, because of the COVID-19 situation, uh, might be a slightly different. Um, so we're now, you know, seeing how, how that evolves. Uh, but that's the normal, yeah, that's a normal turnaround time. I'm excited. I just sent mine in. I can't wait to see it because I want to see what I can do better to age better. I'll be 62 in June and I'm probably a little bit better off than most 62 year olds, but I think I can be better. I really do. I believe it. So we're going to find out. And I'll be talking about my results from my test uh, openly on the air. And uh, we'll probably do a show just about that uh, next time. All right, we're going to do this. We're going to say goodbye to our guests, uh, and we're going to take one quick commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about how to protect yourself from RF. It's a very, very interesting and important discussion. And those of you who know, I have a history in uh, land mobile radio, paging, and cell phone. And I have a very, very good understanding of how RF works. 
And the gentleman that I'm going to be joined by in just a moment is going to show you uh, just how you can protect yourself. So stay tuned. We'll be right back with more Superhuman Radio. How often do you sit with your laptop right on your lap? How much time do you spend on your cell phone? Are you in a technology-packed office Monday through Friday? Are you worried about this type of radiation? Now there's something you can do about it. GetLambs.com. This radiation has been linked to infertility in men, glandular tumors, gut microbiome dysbioses, and impaired sleep quality. Now you can provide 360-degree protection to at-risk parts of your body with radiation-proof apparel from GetLambs.com. Comfortable, breathable, and 99% effective. Go to GetLambs.com and use coupon code SHR for 20% off your order of $100 or more. That's GetLambs.com, G-E-T-L-A-M-B-S.com, and code SHR. Men and women, you've heard about hormone optimization. Do you feel like it's something you want to look into? RenewLifeRx.com is the place to start. Their doctors can help you with the solutions. RenewLifeRx.com has a simple process for lab work, consultation, and taking a deep dive into where your hormone levels can be improved. Superhuman radio listeners get 30% off your initial lab work and consultation. Go to RenewLifeRx.com to schedule your no-obligation phone consultation today. Feel younger, get in better shape, and be more productive at RenewLifeRx.com. Ever wish there was a precise way to gauge your recovery from workout to workout? Or wonder if the money you're spending on your nootropic supplements are actually improving brain function? Maybe you're aging and you're noticing some changes in memory. Wouldn't being able to really test your brain be of great value? Well, now you can with great accuracy with the Brain Gauge. The Brain Gauge lets you test essential components of brain health and track your brain health history and all in the comfort of your own home. Go to GaugeYourBrain.com and use code SHR for $150 off this amazing device. That's GaugeYourBrain.com and SHR for $150 off. Are you a fan of the low-carb lifestyle? Having trouble getting fat adapted on your keto diet? Feel like your digestion has stalled? Now there's Capex. Capex increases fat loss and energy on any low-carb no-carb diet, all while improving digestion. Capex boosts AMPK in muscles by 52% and fat cells by 300%. Capex increases ATP in your liver by 22%, a key part of energy production, all while revving up the fat-burning hormone adiponectin by a whopping 248%. Nothing works like Capex, and now you can get Capex for up to 42% off by going to kenergize.com slash SHR and choosing one of the purchase options and using the code SHR. That's K-E-N-E-R-G-I-Z-E dot com slash SHR and code SHR. Hey, this is Carl. For 14 years, you've heard me talk about can see eye drops and they being the reason that I do not need reading glasses at now 61 years old. But I regularly get emails and messages from people who've been using can see and having some amazing results. Recently, I got an email from a fellow named Chad who, because he was on dexamethasone eye drops for over six months, developed the cataract. Can see eye drops actually reduce my cataract to the point where even my doctor has a hard time finding it. I will never stop using can see eye drops twice a day. I've been using them since 2008, he says. And you should be too. There is no better way to keep your eyes healthy and seeing clearly than can see eye drops. Go to wisechoicemedicine.com today and get on board, and we will both be looking into the future with very clear vision. You are listening to the Super. Superhuman Channel. We're ripped and we're ready. Welcome back to Superhuman Radio, where we're joined, and I'm gonna I'm gonna take an attempt to pronounce your name properly, and <laughs> you have to forgive me. It's Arthur Menard de Calenge, correct? That was there. Like that was good, right? <laughs> that was great. I I, I got to be honest with you. I've been doing this show for 14 years. I pride myself. And being able to pronounce people's names properly, because I think it's the greatest insult to if you can't, if you're not sure, ask. It's the it, you know we we have names for a reason, and I really really strive to make sure that I pronounce. And sometimes I'll go look up how to pronounce a name on the internet before I have a guest on, because I want to honor them uh, by getting their name right. Welcome to the show. I'm very excited to have you on um, to be for here. a couple of reasons. Yeah. So so here, here's some interesting uh, background about me first. 
Um, when I was 22 years old, I moved to Las Vegas, Nevada. I had been working on in college to become an optometrist. And uh, I had my heart broken and I abandoned everything and moved to Las Vegas. And uh, I uh, got involved in the land mobile radio and mobile telephone and paging business. This is back when IMTS mobile phones, 12 channels for the whole city, uh, timeout timers, and paging, of course, and so on. And I actually started a business with a good friend of mine. He's a good friend now, uh, all these years later, John Babcock. And I was the, I was the second cellular agent that Craig McCaw signed up back then. He signed months up in L L.A., and he signed us up, Cellular City. We had another company, Cellular City, with my friend Al Fasano. And he signed us up in, in, in Las Vegas. And, and at that time, only Chicago was online. And they built the site. And I had spent you know a decade in land mobile radio. I understand what RF can do. And I've told stories on this show. Some of my listeners who've been listening for years know. It, it, when I, one day I was putting up a 462 megahertz folded dipole antenna. And the technician brought a, a, a fluorescent light bulb up with him. I said, Jack, what's that for? He's going to show you something. He goes, we're going to measure the quarter wavelength of this antenna. And he had the guy down in the radio room key the transmitter. He started right up against the, 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 tran the antenna. He moved it out. And when he got to 462, the, the frequency quarter wavelength, the bulb lit up. No wires connected to it. Wow. Okay. That was the moment I thought, oh, my God, like, we don't see this stuff, but it, it's doing something. It's really doing something. It's exciting the fluorescent tube. I, another time I told this story on the show, I held an antenna on Mount Potosi when they keyed it, and I felt this tingling. I didn't think nothing of it. And I just took my hand off it. Later that night when I got home, my hand split open like a hot dog when you overcook it, and I had proud flesh sticking out of my hand. I was like, wow. So I understand we live in, and just recently on Facebook, I have a, a spectrum analyzer. It's right here on my desk. I keep it here. And I took pictures for the audience. I did a video for the audience to show them what 4G looks like. And this, this blue wave transmitting from this frequency to that frequency. And you can see the little pips of the higher frequencies coming. And I said, this is a cloud of RF that we live in day in and day out. And more and more research is showing that RF does things to us on a cellular level, does things to us on a cellular level. Now, enter you. You started a company how long ago? Uh, we got started about two years ago. Two years ago. Why? Why what, what, did, what did you know that made you start doing this? So it's actually an interesting story. We I've got a background in engineering and biology originally, and I was at dinner with friends and we started discussing the fact that it's been years that we've heard about the fact that cell phone radiation are probably dangerous for your health, that you shouldn't be keeping them in your, in your pockets, that you shouldn't be using Wi-Fi, et cetera, et cetera. And we were discussing about the fact, hey guys, where are your cell phones um, in our pockets? Who owns a fitness tracker? Um, who has, <laughs> who has Wi-Fi? And, uh, that same evening I was like, all right, well, we've had fun, but let me dig into what the science is around this. And, um, uh, and, and if there is any issues associated with wireless radiation. And this is when I, uh, landed on the website of the WHO, the World Health Organization, and mm -hmm. found out that the categorization of wireless radiation right now was a class 2B human carcinogen, um, which is the same categorization as car exhaust fumes. Right. And the great thing about car exhaust fumes is that you can smell them. And if in this room right now, or the car was running, uh, a carcinogen was running, I would be out of here <laughs> within two minutes. Right. And you'd um, know, you'd know, you'd recognize like, it. You say, what's that smell? Let me, I mean, they even put, they put a, a scent in natural gas very true so that you know that it's leaking in your home otherwise you wouldn't smell it and you die very true and so that was really my haha -ha moment where i was like wow um i can't feel the things i can't see them but they're definitely here and at the same time contrary to um i mean cars are not the right example but contrary to smoking that we we're discussing before um technology is amazing 
Uh, and the fact that we're able to do this interview right now and stream it to uh, thousands of people is just incredible. And um, wireless radiation are enabling all this. And that's kind of how the LEMS story got started, which was about keeping using technology and not changing anything about the way we live today, um, but being able to do so without putting our health and our uh, general uh, well-being at risk. So there are more and more studies. And here's the funny thing. A lot of these really good studies are not being done in the United States, which makes me very suspicious, probably because no one can get funding here in the United States for these studies. But if you go to Scandinavia, Sweden has been way ahead of us. You know, oh, yeah. back in the day, Nokia, uh, Sweden has been way ahead of us. Uh, uh, ironically, uh, Egypt is way ahead of us in this particular area. Uh, even Iran, there's some great studies that came out of Iran. but none out of the united states and when i see that i think that's weird but it's really not when you think about it and that's because we love our phones we don't want to give up our phones don't tell me there's something I, the, the earlier in the show i'm telling people not to drink and smoke anymore oh now you want me to give it to my cell phone to call forget it i'm not going to listen to you anymore but listen i'm telling you something there are studies that show and i don't mean one numerous studies that show the following that having a cell phone call 30 minutes before going to bed increases deep sleep latency by as much as 50%. There are studies that show that exposure to different frequencies of RF change the landscape of the microbiome in your gut. There are studies that show that wearing your phone, now it doesn't say this specifically, but you can deduce this. There, are, We did a show about changes in heart valve function, uh, idiopathic mitral valve prolapse. There are cilia. There are cilia on each cell. They, they're anywhere from two microns to uh, two millimeters long. And these cilia are specifically there for cellular to cellular communication. They're basically the cell's antenna. That's what they are. And they're showing that cilia is picking up something, they said something in the study because it's done here in the United States, that's confusing the valve and causing mitral valve prolapse. And I connected the dots. It's picking up RF. How many times do you see a guy with his pocket, his, his, his phone in his pocket right over his heart? It's causing rhythm issues with people's hearts. Okay. Remember what I said before, the quarter wavelength. Some of these little cilia, the cilia are exactly the right quarter wavelength for some of the new emerging 5G frequencies coming out, 6 gigahertz and up. And later in the show, I'm going to talk about the myth that people are trying to confuse. They're saying, oh, 5G is causing COVID. It's not. I'm going to talk about that later. And I'm going to, I'm going to let you stay away from that because I'm going to splash crazy all over everybody in a little while. <laughs> but the reality is that RF is affecting us on a cellular level. Egypt, they did the earliest study using the old... 2G and 3G generation, second generation and third generation phones, they just put them beneath the rat's cage, male rat's cage. And they turned them on but didn't make any phone calls because people think if you're not using your phone, it's not transmitting. It's transmitting constantly. It's sending data to the cell tower. The tell cell tower is sending data back. Are you there? Here I am. You know, go to that tower, go to this tower. Constantly. You're not on the phone. It's constantly transmitting. That's why if you sleep with your phone next to your head, your sleep probably sucks. And I can fix that right now. Turn your phone off and go to sleep without it, and your sleep yeah. will get better. But when you look at some of these studies, the rodents' sperm motility dropped by 80%. 80%. We have a huge problem right now with male infertility. A lot of these guys are carrying their phones in their pocket. It's easy to fix. Get the phone away or wear a pair of underwear that are RF shielded. That's where you come into the picture. You saw this developing need and you created a whole line of, of, of uh, apparel, right? You have hats, underwear. What else? Don't you even have shirts? We do. Yeah, we have T-shirts um, and we have a lot more coming as well. Um, and, and yeah, the, the idea, we, we read the same studies and you're, you're just even, you're, you're barely scraping the surface of what's out there today because we're talking about thousands of studies out there uh, showing the adverse effect of wireless radiation. And at the same time, as I was saying, like keeping your cell phone away from your pocket in a world where we check our phone, I think 350 times a day on average 
is just not something that people are willing to do naturally. And so we uh, developed the next best alternative, which was, okay, if you want to keep yourself in your, in your pocket, can we shield your body from those waves? And what we looked into is, okay, is there any physical principles that we can use? Is there any technology out, out there or already allowing us to do this? And we found out that NASA spacesuits have a built-in radiation-proof technology because if you're an astronaut and you're going to space, on a six-month journey, you're exposed to approximately 1,600 chest x-rays in terms of amount of exposure to radiation that you're taking. And so um, the NASA engineers have developed a radiation-proof technology that is directly embedded within the spacesuits of the astronauts. And so we use the same physical principle which is called electromagnetic shielding. And we integrated this into a fabric that we can wear um, on, in normal clothing and that is comfortable and soft and that would act just as a regular, uh, regular fabric. Um, and yeah, that's the, the idea behind so, Lens. So uh, RF shielding is measured in decibels, dB. So the hat or the shirt, for instance, how how much of a db reduction do you see in incident rf that is that is hitting you uh yeah we're at the uh, 30 db reduction we'll say that again 30 three zero that's great so theoretically you you're not getting a hundred percent out but you're probably getting about 90 percent of the rf out of 99.9 uh, uh, .9 actually 99 okay okay excellent so so theoretically if someone, and you know, this is something that's interesting because if you ask people today in the United States, everybody sleep sucks, right? Oh, yeah. And even if you unplug your phone and put it away and go to the extremes that I do, I unplug the router before I go to bed and I unplug my cordless base station before I go to bed. I wish I had a, I wish I could just flip the power on the house completely and just leave the heater and air conditioning running. That when I, next, next house I build, I'm going to modify some things. But that still doesn't solve the problem that my neighbor's got a router, that neighbor's got a router, they've got cell phones, they've got cordless phones. So by me doing this at home, I can't really protect myself. But if I slept with the Get Lambs hat on, I probably would stop the RF from reaching the brain and causing any type of activity at night. What do you think? I mean, very true. And this is an issue that is even more present in big cities like New York or uh, Los Angeles or wherever you're, you might be living if you're living in a, in a big building with um, tons of neighbors. So I was doing this experiment at home the other time um, of uh, turning on my Wi-Fi and counting. I think I'm at 25 or anywhere between 25 to 30 Wi-Fi sources um, right in my bedroom at the moment. And so that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting when you, when you look at it this way. Um, now, have you ever, have you ever put your the 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 cap the skull cap on and slept with it um i do yeah um not every night especially right now i live in los angeles it's pretty hot here <laughs> yeah um but i do sometimes in the winter and i've noticed a significant difference on my deep sleep actually when doing right. it versus not doing it uh it's something that i I'm one of those guys who has shitty sleep as well. Uh, and I've tried a lot of things to improve it. And that was actually one of the steps that was most helpful. I turn off my um, cell phone at night as well. Um, and I turn off my Wi-Fi. So I've set up a quick tip for your call. Um, what you can do is buy a programming plug, uh, which will automatically turn, out, uh, turn off at night um, during the hours at which you sleep. And then you don't have to worry about it. Um, That's nice. How about how about coming out? Remember back in the old days, people slept with a nightcap on, right? Because there was yes. this, it was like a little little very very light hat with a little ball on the top, or it looked like a skull cap. <laughs> how about coming out with one specifically for sleep, so in the warm weather people can still sleep with it on their head? It's a great idea, and I'd love to bring back this style. To be honest, uh, it looked amazing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and I see pajamas following too, right? So if you're going to get the RF off of your brain. You may as well get it off of as much of your body as possible because there's, you know, people think that grounding sheets do this. They don't do this. Incident RF is still going to rain down on your body, even if you're uh, on a grounding sheet. And in fact, I would go as far as saying a grounding sheet may turn you into an antenna 
Very true. And, and, and I love that you touched on that because that's something that people do not realize is that in order to create the electromagnetic shielding that we're talking about, or also called as a Faraday cage, what you need is to shield and completely the body that you're trying to shield. So if you look at your microwave that's using the same principle, um, look at the door of your microwave and you'll see that there is a aluminum grid in it. This grid is actually in everywhere in your microwave and that's what creates a completely closed off enclosure. And with um, just a little bit of silver, for instance, um, which is conduct a conductive material that allows us to do this type of uh, shielding, if you're not, uh, first of all, building your silver grid the right way, and second of all, if you're not putting the silver grid everywhere around the body, um, then you're actually doing the opposite effect, which is silver attracts radiation. You're turning yourself right. into an antenna. And what you do is <laughs> that you're effectively doing the opposite of what you're trying to achieve. Right. Um, so I would highly recommend paying attention to this whenever looking at products that have silver and that um, we have, like after launching lambs on the market, we've had a bunch of companies coming out with products, copycat products that actually do not work because of this, because they use less silver, because they don't get how the technology works. Um, and that's been uh, something that we've been warning people about quite a bit. Yeah, exactly. And then, and then there's a, when you, when you have an antenna, there is something called a sink that energy must escape somewhere. And when that energy escapes, it also causes heat. And so your body becomes the sink S I N K for the, uh, for the RF that's accumulating. If you're not completely enclosed, uh, you, and like you said, and you become an antenna. And that's why I, I question whether or not grounding sheets and grounding yourself is actually a good idea today, given the fact that we have all this RF uh, around us. Talk about some of the other studies that maybe I have missed. I, I, we, we know about infertility. We know about brain activity. We know about the microbiome. We, and, and we all carry our own personal transmitter, so we don't even have to rely on the ambient RF in our, in our environment. We're doing the work for it. Mm -hmm. what, what other research have you seen recently that seems uh, uh, very interesting? So I, one thing that I've been kind of digging into in the recent uh, month is actually the molecular, uh, or rather cellular in this case, um, patterns as to what happens when a cell is exposed to EMF radiation. Um, and here is the gist of what I've learned so far. Um, cell membranes are polarized naturally and EMFs stand for electromagnetic frequencies that naturally polarized as well. And so when a wireless radiation, such as your cell phone radiation or your Wi-Fi radiation will get in contact with one of, your cell, one of the cells of your body, this polarization of the wave um, will mess with the integrity of the cell membrane. And this is taken by your cell as an external aggression. And so what we've done, um, this is actually a study that we've done here, um, is we've studied the immune system reaction uh, of your body when exposed to a cell phone call. And what we see, so the best way to, uh, so your immune system, um, Carl, you probably know this better than I do, but um, you essentially have two modes, rest and digest, or fight and flight. And um, your body performs better when your immune system is either in check or in rest and digest most of the time, unless you're doing a particular sports um, effort. And so what we found is that the moment you make a cell phone call, or you have a cell phone next to you, your body switches to be in, um, in fight and flight mode. And more interestingly, if we shield your, your body from radiation using our fabric, um, and we put a cell phone next to you, we do not have um, the switch to um, fight and flight. And if we're in fight and flight, uh, within 10 minutes of being shielded, you go back to rest and digest. Um, and what's super interesting there is that your immune system not being in check leads to um, inflammation uh, altogether. And inflammation is the root cause of so many of today's issues. Um, and it's, and it's, 
it's something that we uh, see being increased by a number of things that we put in our bodies, including <laughs> alcohol and tobacco that we were just that you guys were just discussing before. Uh, but right. this is also a factor, and um, what increased inflammation and um, and essentially oxidative, oxidative stress leads to are is um, cancer, cardiovascular diseases. Uh, neurological disorders, a variety of issues that uh, in the long term um, are, are significantly impacting our health. So let's talk specifically about the apparel. I know about the hat and the underwear. You have T-shirts. Do you have anything else uh, that people can purchase that, that offers this perfect, a protective effect? So we're working on a lot of new products that will come out in the next few months. One of the things that uh, were key in us developing Lens is that we take great proud, uh, pride sorry, in developing great products. And so we <laughs> actually take a lot of time to come up with uh, each, of, in each and every single one of our products because we want to make sure that when you're wearing the shirt, when you're wearing the underwear or the beanie, uh, you're wearing your best shirt, your best underwear, your best beanie. Right. You're not making a trade-off of like, hey, I'm wearing that thing that is super uncomfortable, but at least I'm being protected from EMS. Right. That's, right. Um, like we're trying to give people a no-brainer choice, which is, hey, this is already a super comfortable T-shirt. It's also antibacterial because silver has natural antibacterial properties um, and heat diffusing as well. So it's essentially just a better T-shirt in the first place. It feels good, it looks good, um, and it blocks radiation. And so we have um, a few new product lines that will come out this year. Um, I can't spoil the surprise just yet, but for people following us on social media or um, who purchase and are in our mailing list, you'll get the news first. Um, and uh, and yeah, we've, what's what's been great is that we have a community of customers who are super engaged with uh, LAMS, and so we're able to co-develop uh, our products with our customers, making sure that we address um, the number one needs uh, first, and um, and we have a very very long list right now that we're working uh, that we're working to 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 uh, get products out the door as soon as possible. Um, so obviously, the, the, these since it's made with silver, it's 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 somewhat more expensive let's say than fruit of the loom t-shirts at target oh yeah. oh yeah how about the durability do they last a long time so that's the beautiful thing about silver is that it actually makes the product more resistant to washes and just overall being worn out so uh my personal pairs i've i've been wearing the first prototypes for i think like three years now um wow. and that's still fine that's kind right. of crazy. The, um, the first prototypes were made with cotton, um, and the cotton starts to wear off now, but the silver is still perfectly fine. Um, so that's one of the good things about the, uh, the, the product itself is that the durability is also great. Um, but yeah, the, the cost of making these compared to regular underwear, we're, we're, I mean, we know actually where we, we stand, we're about 15, times more expensive to produce than oh the, yeah i bet silver silver is not cheap silver is <laughs> you know it's a precious metal i mean you're wearing a precious metal you really care about yourself if you're wearing something made out of silver let's be honest uh the website is getlambs.com g-e-t-l-a-m-b-s.com the code is shr to save 20 percent off check them out i i think the underwear for men and i think the skull cap is a must for everybody given the fact that we live in literally a soup of radio frequencies today and no no one's being honest about what these things are doing to you they're really not uh we're going to take a uh, last commercial break and when we come back i'm going to discuss um i don't know if it's purposeful but there is a lot of misinformation going around 5g is bad stuff i will tell you that 5g is bad stuff i'm not i'm not going to sugarcoat that but it's not causing coronavirus i can assure you of that as well and I'm going to explain in very simple terms. I'm going to bring everybody up to speed. Uh, we're going to have a little RF 101 class. Uh, we're going to say goodbye to Arthur. Arthur, thanks for being here today. Uh, love your products. Getlambs.com is the place to go. Use the code SHR. Show them some love. They are a sponsor. And you know the only reason why this show is out 
And you get this information for free is because of the sponsors. So check them out. We'll take one quick commercial break. We'll be right back with more of the Superhuman Radio Show. Stay tuned. How often do you sit with your laptop right on your lap? How much time do you spend on your cell phone? Are you in a technology-packed office Monday through Friday? Are you worried about this type of radiation? Now there's something you can do about it. GetLambs.com. This radiation has been linked to infertility in men, glandular tumors, gut microbiome dysbiosis, and impaired sleep quality. Now you can provide 360-degree protection to at-risk parts of your body with radiation-proof apparel from GetLambs.com. Comfortable, breathable, and 99% effective. Go to GetLambs.com and use coupon code SHR for 20% off your order of $100 or more. That's GetLambs.com, G-E-T-L-A-M-B-S.com, and code SHR. Men and women, you've heard about hormone optimization. Do you feel like it's something you want to look into? RenewLifeRx.com is the place to start. Their doctors can help you with the solutions. RenewLifeRx.com has a simple process for lab work, consultation, and taking a deep dive into where your hormone levels can be improved. Superhuman radio listeners get 30% off your initial lab work and consultation. Go to RenewLifeRx.com to schedule your no obligation phone consultation today feel younger get in better shape and be more productive at renewliferx.com ever wish there was a precise way to gauge your recovery from workout to workout or wonder if the money you're spending on your nootropic supplements are actually improving brain function maybe you're aging and you're noticing some changes in memory wouldn't being able to really test your brain be of great value well now you can with great accuracy with the brain gauge the Brain Gauge lets you test essential components of brain health and track your brain health history and all in the comfort of your own home. Go to gaugeyourbrain.com and use code SHR for $150 off this amazing device. That's gaugeyourbrain.com and SHR for $150 off. Are you a fan of the low-carb lifestyle? Having trouble getting fat adapted on your keto diet? Feel like your digestion has stalled? Now there's Capex. Capex increases fat loss and energy on any low-carb, no-carb diet, all while improving digestion. Capex boosts AMPK in muscles by 52% and fat cells by 300%. Capex increases ATP in your liver by 22%, a key part of energy production, all while revving up the fat fat burning hormone adiponectin by a whopping 248%. Nothing works like Capex and now you can get Capex for up to 42% off by going to kenergize.com/shr and choosing one of the purchase options and using the code SHR. That's k e n e r g i z e.com/shr and code SHR. Hey, this is Carl. For 14 years you've heard me talk about can see eye drops and they being the reason that I do not need reading glasses at now 61 years old. But I regularly get emails and messages from people who've been using can -C and having some amazing results. Recently, I got an email from a fellow named Chad, who, because he was on dexamethasone eye drops for over six months, developed a cataract. can -C eye drops actually reduced my cataract to the point where even my doctor has a hard time finding it. I will never stop using can -C eye drops twice a day. I've been using them since 2008, he says. And you should be too. There is no better way to keep your eyes healthy and seeing clearly than can see eye drops go to wisechoicemedicine.com today and get on board and we will both be looking into the future with very clear vision you're listening to the superhuman channel we're ripped and we're ready hey welcome back so this is going to be uh, Radio Frequency Engineering School 101. And we're going to do this show and this discussion specifically because there is some real stupid, stupid stuff going around the Internet right now. And I'm not saying people are stupid. Don't get me wrong. Um, people are worried. The truth is. So I get regularly asked if I think COVID-19 is being caused by, for, by 5G. And it's absolutely not happening that way. It definitely isn't. There's no doubt about it. And I think when we're finished talking, you'll feel the same way. Um, the reality is that 5G is not a good thing. It's not. And 4G wasn't a good thing. 3G wasn't a good thing. 
this uh, accumulation of radio frequencies in our environment are having an effect on us and they're taking a toll on our health. And it's the God's honest truth. And maybe we won't know about it for another hundred years until they find another way to make money on uh, radio communication and, and they do away with it. But it, but the research is out there. The research is sound. It's, it's not baloney research. It's not being paid for by the cellular companies. In fact, I don't see any good research being paid for by the cellular companies because they don't want people to be concerned about buying their next $1,200 iPhone. Um, but the reality is that while RF is bad and COVID-19 are bad, they have zero to do with anything with each other. So let, let's start off with what real 5G is, first of all. So 4G goes up to 5.7 gigahertz and 5G starts at, um, I'm sorry, 4, 4G goes up to 6.7 gigahertz and, and 5G starts at 6 gigahertz but it goes all the way up to 60 gigahertz. And the higher you go, the more dangerous it becomes because the smaller the frequency becomes and because now it's able to excite uh, smaller uh, cilia and smaller cells on, and, and, and tissue. Because remember, RF interacts through the phenomenon of attenuation. And it's kind of a lock and key relationship loosely. And that means that in order for a radio frequency to stimulate something, it must be an exact ratio down to one one hundredth of the waveform. So theoretically, if the waveform is is a hundred millimeters from peak to trough, then an antenna, a successful antenna, could be one millimeter. And anything in between that, it's not going to be excited, right? If you hit a one and a half millimeter. Uh, uh, antenna, it's, it, it's not going to be excited. Okay, so this is the phenomenon of attenuation. So the next thing I want to talk about is high 5G is, uh, I'm sorry, low 5G is 5, uh, 5 gigahertz, uh, 6 gigahertz, I'm getting ahead of myself, to 24 gigahertz. High 5G, which is the future, 24 gigahertz to 60 gigahertz. Why? Why Why are these frequencies, these higher and higher frequencies uh, needed? And you have to look all the way back to the days of modems. We all remember, those of you old enough remember dial-up. Dial-up sounds like static to you, doesn't it? It's not. The phenomenon of frequency shift keying was developed by Motorola for the military. What frequency shift keying is, if you take a frequency of one hertz that means from trough to peak one per second that's one hertz one cycle per second that means the trough to the peak from the trough to the peak is one cycle so if you had a point and they were passing one would pass completely every second that's one hertz so what they discovered about frequency shift keying was that you could actually let data, instead of analog sound, you can use frequencies to, to tr transmit digital. So the trough could be a zero and the peak could be a one. So you can actually put data on those peaks and troughs. And that was what frequency sh shift keying was all about. So then what we learned was that the lower frequencies couldn't carry near as much data as the higher frequencies. And this is why there's a race to introduce higher and higher frequencies. So one hertz is one oscillation per second, one trough and one peak passing a point. One kilohertz, which you see all the time, I'm sure you see KHZ. Uh, I think the KHZ you'll see, AM radios you'll see in, in hertz, HZ. FM radios you'll see in kilohertz. So one kilohertz is 1,000 oscillations per second. Now you're really talking. So... You're seeing a 1,000 peaks and troughs pass this point every second. So now if you're transmitting data, wow, that's a 1,000 bits of data a second. You see where I'm going with this? Okay. So then we go right to gigahertz. Gigahertz is 1 billion data points per second. Wow. So every second you can transfer 1 billion bits of data. And this is why there's a race to get up above 6 gigahertz. So 5G is 6 gigahertz. 
every second on a frequency, they can send 6 billion bits of data. We talk about bandwidth in the communications business as well as in the commuter, computer business. Well, this is now you're really getting up there. So just imagine if you had 24 giga, giga, gigahertz, right? The, the, the top end of low 5G, 24 billion bits of data per second. Now you can send high definition video. You can send real time stuff. You No glitches. No, I mean, we're talking about opening that pipe up of bandwidth like a sewer pipe in the street. It's huge now. And when they get up to 60 gigahertz, they're saying, and this is why it was developed. So people like to say, oh, um, 5G is a weapon. The military uses it. And you can use RF. There's no doubt about it. They used it all the way back in the 50s and the 60s. They knew that they, if they pointed an antenna with enough frequency, uh, high enough frequency and enough power coming out of it, they could stun people with it. That's just further evidence that RF does something to us, right? Like, so just keep that in the back of your mind. But the reason that the military wanted 5G is because they could get pinpoint data from an entire battlefield in real time. They could control drones and make them do – now you're talking about being able to control thousands and tens of thousands of things and getting tens of thousands of data points back every second. Now, this is going to revolutionize uh, automated warfare. This is why they want 5G. So, And that's the reason why the cellular industry wants 5G. They want it because they'll sell you phones that'll do stuff that you've never been able to do because they needed more bandwidth. Now, let's talk about something separately. Let's switch the, switch the tone here for a second. Let's talk about COVID-19. So people like to say, oh, 5G is causing inflammation. It possibly is. But... COVID-19 turns on the immune system to such a degree that we hear about cytokine storms. All a cytokine storm is, is the immune system is overreacting and lighting the body up like fire. It's lighting the body up like fire because the immune system is kicked in and it's going to scorch earth. It wants to kill everything and anything. It's not even sure what it wants to kill. The other problem with inflammation is it thickens the blood. So, those of you who know, people take aspirin to thin their blood out. Things that are anti-inflammatory thin the blood. Things that are pro-inflammatory thicken the blood. And stay with me. We're almost done here. We're almost done here. So a lot of people like to say, oh, the 5G is causing thickening of the blood. No, it's not. It's not. The, the COVID-19 is causing thickening of the blood because your immune system is kicked into gear and you are literally turning into a congealed mass because your blood is getting thicker and thicker. Anti-inflammatory thins the blood. Pro-inflammatory thickens the blood. Fact. But here's the real fact that nobody's paying attention to. When they listen to these people on the internet and these people say, yeah, 5G is causing COVID-19. This, is, this, this isn't even critical thinking. This is just looking at simple data and asking yourself, could this be true? Currently, 34 countries have 5G networks, almost all of them in the low 5G. But yet, 150-plus countries have cases of COVID-19 and deaths from COVID-19. So if, if 5G was driving COVID-19, we would see 34 countries have COVID-19, only the countries that have 5G. So it, it's not... It's not logical. It doesn't make sense. Please don't follow this BS narrative. In fact, this narrative is hurting. It's hurting real information. People who are thinking, oh, you know, my grandmother died from COVID-19. It's because of 5G. It's not because of 5G. She got the virus. 5G isn't killing people. And they're not calling it COVID-19. Okay. But 5G is dangerous. Don't I'm not mix, mix, mixing my words here. 5G is dangerous, and we just don't even really know yet what 5G is going to do to us. Probably for another 30 or 40 years, we're going to start seeing new high levels of suspicious diseases. Like idiopathic mitral valve prolapse is like on the rise. Nobody understands why. I think it's from RF. I think it's from cell phones. I do. And who knows, maybe all the gut dysbioses that we're seeing in the population is from cell phones and not the foods we eat. Because there are good studies out there that show that RF, 
the same frequencies we're using in 4G right now are causing changes in the landscape of the, the gut microbiome. But the truth is nobody knows what 5G is doing yet. We are the guinea pigs right here. We are the experiment. However, I can assure you that it's not causing COVID-19. So please don't pass that silly information around. So that is your lesson today about RF. I hope you got something good out of it and you can talk intelligently to people who say, I think, I think RF is causing COVID-19. I think 5G is doing it. Just ask them, well, there's only 34 countries that have a 5G network up, but there's 150 plus com countries that have this virus. How do you explain that? Believe me, they'll go searching for some BS explanation if they want to stick to their guns, but just don't buy it. All right, look, that's it for today. I'm off tomorrow. We'll see you Monday with more Superhuman Radio. Please share the show. If you think you learned something today, please share the show and help someone else learn too. We'll see you next week.